This is not just a conventional opening of an art exhibition, it is also the promotion of sensitivism, or, more precisely, of visual sensitivism, a visual concept I have formulated. Here is a brief overview of how the concept evolved over years, and how it can be applied. In 1976, I had a conversation with Katerina Jovanovic, an art historian from Belgrade. She claimed then that here we have no critics or art historians capable of distinguishing between an era and a new visual art element. Earlier, when painters had worked in accordance with prearranged canons, they had used only the canonically prescribed visual elements. At that time, new elements were considered as errors. Today, errors tend to be considered as new visual art elements. I asked Katerina how she distinguished a new element from a mistake, and she gave me an example. Let's say, said she, you paint a table with five plates on it. Four of these plates are in alignment while the fifth plate is mistakenly painted at an angle. If you disregard it and continue painting in the other table pieces, glasses, a vase, or a jar all in alignment with the first four plates, then the fifth plate will be an error. The odd position of the fifth plate catches the eye of the viewer, who cannot explain the meaning of it since in fact there is no meaning to it, it is simply an error, a result of negligence. Rare are those viewers who are able to overcome the impact of an error and appreciate a whole painting notwithstanding the error in it. If during further work you notice the error, and for some reason you do not wish to correct it, you can misalign the other pieces of the table set, the glassware, the flatware. In this case, the misaligned fifth plate will be a new element, the point where the viewer's gaze can flawlessly change direction. Ultimately, it depends on the artist's creativity what will be achieved by this shift in the direction of the viewer's gaze. If an element does not disrupt the flow of the viewer's eye, it cannot be considered an error. However, the element that disrupts the viewer's attention may and should be considered an error. If a painting contains several errors, it becomes impassable for the viewer. Errors can effectively smother any work of art. There are countless possibilities of making errors while painting. An error can be made in the sketch, for example, if a line does not follow the perspective but clashes with the geometry of the painting. It can be a color patch which is out of place, which distorts the surrounding surface which then loses the capacity to suggest motion. It is also an error when the directions of surfaces and shapes collide and so disrupt the flow of the viewer's eye. After the conversation with Katerina, I began to pay increasing attention to defining the character of space, atmosphere and climate in my paintings. I duly re-examined every line I painted, to make certain it was positioned as intended. In general, I became more careful in the control of all elements in my works. Before 1976, I would begin to view a painting by concentrating on its four corners, so that I could absorb the whole picture. In that way, the weight of certain forms could be seen and the suggestion of movement could be felt in surfaces and forms. However, that approach to viewing paintings did not provide a precise sense of space inside them. As I worked, I have formulated a simple procedure for viewing paintings, my own as well as those of other artists. I start by systematically observing lines. I fix my gaze on one end of the line I consider most important, then I follow it steadily to the other end. After that I go to the next line, and the next, until I come to feel the character of all lines, their positions inside the painting, and therefore I sense the size of the entire space contained within the painting. This sculpture, which actually is an enlarged line, is exhibited here for training. I advise everyone to stand in front of it, focus on one end of the line, then move the gaze along the line to the other end and back. Already after the first or second passage, the rhythm of your breathing will change and you will feel a pleasant relaxation. I advise everyone to try it, you may be surprised. 
If you adopt this approach to viewing paintings, you will see, or rather feel them more intensely. By following the lines which guide you along like paths, you come to feel the character of the lines, as well as the character, atmosphere, and climate of the space inside the painting. In the next step, I focus my attention on surfaces. I take note of their texture, their suggestion of movement, and the degree of their materiality. If a surface does carry an intention of movement, it may appear to shrink or to expand, to curve or to shear in any one of the possible directions, etc. Only after a detailed examination of surfaces I focus on forms, in the first place on their position inside the space contained within the painting. Forms can be static, standing still in their places, or there may be a cohesive force drawing them together. Forms may seem to repel each other by forces of different intensity, which may act intermittently or continually. Forms may have their own directionality, intention of movement. As I move slowly through the space encompassed by the painting, I collect and store information I come across during the observation of lines, surfaces, and forms. Then I fuse this information into an overall impression which helps me become aware of the character, atmosphere, climate, and the degree of plasticity of the observed space. The perspective of the space in a painting can be three-dimensional, plastic or mental. A single painting may contain several three-dimensional spaces. In addition to the three-dimensional space, a painting may also contain a plastic and forward slash or a mental space. If the space is plastic, differences may exist in the degree of plasticity. A painting may have only a mental space, while mental space may successfully coexist with three-dimensional and forward slash or plastic space. When there are no errors in a painting or when they are small, then my gaze travels freely across the entire space of the painting, I gather impressions easily and relatively quickly and I can completely grasp the character and climate of the space in the painting. When I can confidently feel the space, I concentrate on the time which exists in that space, because, besides space, time is another domain of existence. In my paintings, I create connections between surfaces by slightly shading the colors, which can also be understood as a flow of time. I mostly do it unconsciously, so when I come to the point I see fit to deal with the time component, it is already there. The time that exists inside the space of a painting can be fast or slow, old or young, continuous, cyclic, intermittent, pulsating, dangerous, limited, modest, surly, etc. Many people told me that, in their opinion, time cannot be felt in a painting. I asked them in return if they ever tried to do it. Their unanimous answer was no. That is why they did not feel it, they never tried to do this. When you gaze enters the space of a painting and when you feel its atmosphere, then try to concentrate on time. On the feeling of time. If your sensitivity has been activated, there is a chance that you will feel it. If my gaze can move freely within the space of a painting, if the character and climate of the space are defined and if time can be sensed, then I try to simultaneously feel both space and time, that is, I try to perceive the space-time of a painting. To feel the space-time of a painting is to feel its all-inclusive virtual reality, it is to feel this painting as a work of art. While applying this method of viewing, I realized that a work of art is not part of the reality, that it exists parallel to it. A viewer can build a parallel reality based on a work of art. Humans are attracted to art, to works of art, because they sense this parallel existence, this parallel reality. The character of space presented in a painting can be felt even in reproductions. However, this is not the case with the time that ticks inside a painting, which is difficult or even impossible to perceive. I have become acquainted with the works of great painters from reproductions and books. I enjoyed the fine plasticity of space in the paintings of the great impressionists. When I saw originals, 
I was surprised at the speed of time in them. In most of them it was fast, but in some it literally raced by. With the time component visible, these paintings did not look serene and beautiful anymore, they looked much more serious. Similar changes occurred with Chagall's Cubist paintings and Picasso's analytical Cubist paintings. While reproductions felt overcrowded and constrained, originals conveyed the feeling of slow, melancholic time which completely changed the mood of these paintings. The feeling of their space-time was quite pleasant. It happened to me on several occasions that a painting of mine felt different in a gallery and in the studio. A painting is a parallel reality, so if reality, i.e., the environment that surrounds the painting, changes, the painting will change the feeling it conveys. Even if we are not aware of it, we are comparing the reality inside the painting with the reality in which we are standing in front of the painting appreciating it. Nowadays, when I enter a gallery or a museum, I walk around until I can feel the space around me, until I begin to feel at home. Only then do I embark on a detailed observation of the exhibited works of art. This method of appreciating works of art, which is also a method of painting, is what I call visual sensitivism, or just sensitivism. I use this term because I fully, openly and sincerely experience and reveal each millimeter as well as the totality of any painting, no matter if it is my own or painted by others. This method of art appreciation may be used to view sculptures as well as to watch theater performances and movies. A theater performance will be a work of art if it transforms the stage into a parallel reality which has its own atmosphere and climate whose time runs differently from that in the auditorium. There is a difference between theater audience and viewers of artworks. While actors, employing their energy, concentration and dedication, make the audience perceive another world, it is up to art viewers themselves to break into the virtual space of a painting, their interest giving birth to a parallel reality and rewarding them in return with a unique experience, catharsis, and happiness. With most viewers, the viewing of a painting usually begins with their central vision trying to identify the dominant part of the painting. When it is found, the viewer focuses on it and his forward slash her peripheral vision promptly absorbs the whole picture. In a matter of seconds, the viewer decides what his forward slash her impression of the painting is, in the sense of whether it looks like this or that and whether he forward slash she likes it or not. Most viewers satisfy their artistic needs with that much aesthetic exercise. A minority continues to scrutinize paintings, trying to figure out why they like or dislike a particular painting, trying to discover a message in it, and deciding whether they agree with it or not. With this kind of approach to viewing, only serious blunders can be identified but it is not possible to decide whether the observed painting is or is not a work of art. A calm and consistent sensitivistic approach allows us to feel the space-time in paintings, i.e., which paintings are works of art. Paintings which are not works of art may carry messages in their own right, they may be pleasantly decorative, but they are experienced at a level of consciousness different from that used to experience paintings that are works of art. Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa seems to be suitable for demonstrating the applicability of my artistic concept. If we apply the common method of viewing a painting, i.e., if we focus our central vision on the face of Mona Lisa and we capture the rest of the painting with our peripheral vision, we shall not notice that the landscapes on the left and right are so different that they can be easily considered to belong to two completely different spaces. If we apply the sensitivistic procedure and start to follow the lines, we shall quickly come to feel the space of the painting and notice differences in the perspective and atmosphere of the landscapes on the left and right of the central figure. On the left side of the painting, the land perspective is clearly visible. If the horizon is extended, we can see that the water surface is not horizontal, but it rises for some 20 to 30 degrees. 
As the perspective changes direction on the horizon, it is difficult to define the atmosphere and climate of the landscape. It seems to me that the time that flows there is associated with death. On the right side of the painting, the landscape gradually rises towards the glass mountain, a land formation I named so because it appears rigid and slightly translucent. As the landscape seems to be descending towards the viewer, the depicted stream follows its natural course. The climate of the landscape is agreeable, the atmosphere is cheerful, but still the landscape is somehow somber. The time that runs through this landscape is finely vibrant. The landscapes on the left and right of Mona Lisa are completely different in atmosphere, climate and time. The great master Leonardo managed to place Mona Lisa in two spaces and two times, and this is what creates a mystery. When we look at Leonardo's painting, the simultaneous existence of two spaces does not disturb us visually because these spaces are not fully materialized. When I started to paint the first variation I understood why Leonardo was not specific about the two landscapes, if they were more substantial, they would draw attention away from the central figure. When I became aware of those differences, I decided to paint two variations, one with the left-hand side of the landscape extending to the right side, the other with the right-hand side of the landscape extending left. When I achieved the main objective, that is, when I made an integrated space which worked on the same time scale, I stopped. This small change was sufficient to show that the expression on Mona Lisa's face changed when she existed in a single space. With this example I wanted to show that the sensitivistic approach can be effectively applied in art evaluation as well as in creative work. In a contemplative manner, sensitivism focuses our attention on the expressive potentials of visual art elements like line, surface, form, their rhythm, direction, composition. Therefore, it can be said that sensitivism is neo-modernism. Thank you for your attention.